Good morning or good afternoon. And on behalf of the Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation, I extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us for today's high level event on Africa's human wildlife crisis. My name is John Scanlon and I'm the CEO of the EPA Foundation. And we have a wonderful program planned for you today. But firstly, a reminder that today's event is being broadcast in three languages, English, French, and Portuguese. And to hear us, you must select your preferred language from the interpretation icon at the bottom of your page, as is shown on this slide. I hope that you've all managed to find that icon and select your preferred language, and you are free to switch be between languages at any time. And we are most grateful to our friends at Conservation International for providing the funding that has enabled us to broadcast today's event in the three languages and to our ABLE interpreters. This event follows a high level event we hosted in May of this year, featuring ministers from Gabon and Kenya, and the screening of a film that was shot in Tanzania and Kenya. And we are delighted that today we will be joined by VIP speakers from Angola, Botswana, Chad, Ethiopia, and Kenya, together with the Executive Director of the Convention on Biological Diversity. We are deeply grateful to all of our VIP speakers for agreeing to participate in today's event, which is being moderated by one of Africa's leading wildlife conservationists, Dr. Winnie Kiru, who is our Director of Government Relations. Before we hand over to Winnie to moderate the high-level discussion and our question and answer session, we will share with you a powerful and thought-provoking film on human elephant conflict in Babilia in Ethiopia. And this film was prepared following a visit to Babili by Greta Laurie, the team leader of our human elephant conflict team earlier this year. And it was Greta together with Winnie and the rest of the team who led the drafting of our new human elephant conflict strategy, which we released earlier this month. Our strategy rests on three interrelated pillars, fostering high level dialogue, enabling local solutions, and amplifying African voices. And we believe that by implementing this strategy between now and 2030, we can make a real difference in addressing the complex challenges of human elephant conflict. The strategy is available in English, French, and Portuguese on our website, and we'd very much welcome your active engagement and support with its implementation. Finally, thank you to the more than 650 people who have registered to join us today including ministers and high-level officials from across our 21 member states. We will now play the short film from Bebile, following which we will go straight to our good friend and colleague, Winnie, to moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Hi, my name is Greta Francesca Iori, and I work with the 21 African member states who make up the Elephant Protection Initiative. Today, we're in my home country in the Babile Elephant Sanctuary found in Eastern Ethiopia. We're here because the Babile Sanctuary is facing severe human elephant conflict, which is compromising the viability of the elephant's survival as well as the livelihood of the people. We are here, some 500 kilometers east of Addis Ababa, because the sanctuary is on the verge of collapse. The survival of the few remaining elephants as well as the livelihoods of my fellow people are under grave threat. There is unprecedented human elephant conflict. Babile's unique landscape makes up 7,000 kilometers of the extensive Somali Maasai biome. Elephants once freely roamed here. Today, they're restricted to a few tiny pockets of land, the last remnants of the Somali elephant race, Africa's most northeastern elephants. The elephant's habitat suffers from devastating fragmentation and destruction caused by ethnic divisions, lack of governance, and climate change. It is a harsh environment where elephants, people, and their livestock compete for water, land, and survival every single day. 
Protected areas in Ethiopia generate little to no significant benefits for local communities, but they are often nature and wildlife's only lifeline in a vastness of threats. Babile's elephants have lost more than three quarters of their land, taken over by farms, roads, and factories. One one Hawasa or Jimmy Hawasa Mamira Juru Amo or Re Sanebu by ye one must the city one Tikahev Warani the Baramevi Sirit Egon Gorbada. It does at the debate. Babile urgently needs effective land use planning, more resources, and high level government intervention. Mafia Ungri in Denekone, Mungus Zilai, Masrat and the Batunikan Mutan. Lemon, and then Bedem Arbuto Kazi, Masrat Chalamangus, and Yam Rasachina, and the Munmut, the Gutanyan. Short term solutions, fences, or watchtowers can buy us time, but they're not enough. We must find a path to prosperity and coexistence for people and elephants, not one at the expense of the other. The wildlife authorities and rangers are demoralized and feel abandoned. Limited capacity and poor performance at all levels. That means the number of scouts, the number of workers, even the budget is so limited. The main gap to save elephant sanctuary is lack of political commitment from government side. But local people also pay the price for this neglect. They need peace and land. The stories we've heard here are heartbreaking because they're the realities of the people who live alongside these elephants. There are no simple solutions. Extreme poverty, Lack of governance at large, ethnic divisions are pushing elephants and people into extremes. One thing is for sure, we can't simply focus only on the technical conservation solutions to this challenge. We're gonna have to center the social, political, cultural, economic realities of the people who live here. And only then will we be able to save this landscape, our wildlife and protect the rights of our people. Good afternoon, everyone. A very critical situation there from Babile. Um, greetings. I'm Dr. Winnie Cairo from the EPI Foundation. I'm speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya. We're very grateful for the hundreds that have joined us this afternoon. And in a moment, we are going to hear from His Excellency Hale Mariam Desalen, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, who is closely involved in efforts to rescue Babile. But first, a reminder, we'll have 20 minutes Q&A with our VIP, after our VIP speeches. So please submit your questions in the Q&A. You can write them in French or Portuguese if you're comfortable with those languages. And if you're following this event online, our hashtags are hashtag coexistence and hashtag African voices. But it is now my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Desalen of Ethiopia, 
who will join us live from New York. Good morning, sir, and over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Winnie. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the EPI Foundation for this opportunity to talk about human elephant conflict and specifically about the grave challenge facing the Babile elephant sanctuary in my own country, Ethiopia. I'm grateful to the EPI Foundation for the short film about Babile. It's heartbreaking that we have just uh, seen it, which includes the authentic voice of the people living in and around the sanctuary, and as well as uh, those striving to protect it. Babile is a place that is close to my heart, but it is no exaggeration to say that it is in crisis. Ever since the sanctuary was established back in 1970, it has faced great challenges from the very beginning. Ethnic tensions, lack of uh, good governance, conflict and the refugees even coming in there, the lack of tourism opportunities and all of these problems now exacerbated by climate change, as we know, and the biodiversity loss. The results are tragic. A sanctuary established primarily to conserve one of uh, the Horn of Africa's last viable elephant populations now has only some 200 to 250 elephants left. Because of internal displacement and other human encroachment, populous elephants have lost more than 80% of their former range and have been pushed out of many of the most fertile valleys uh, in the west of the sanctuary the sanctuary as uh, in the film. Until recently, Babilis elephants were being killed by ivory poachers, but in the last few years, we have seen that more are being killed as a result of human elephant conflict rather than poaching. People meanwhile are being killed by elephants as well. At least 15 people died in the years from 2016 to 2019 by elephants. As for Babilis, other wildlife, you can imagine the famous black man lions, the leopards, the kudus, and etc. This, I'm sorry to say, have almost extinct, disappeared. My foundation, uh, the Haile Mariam and Roman Foundation, is not prepared to stand by and watch this sanctuary disappear. We are determined to save Babilis elephants and also build sustainable futures for the people who live in and around the sanctuary. That's why uh, my foundation worked so hard together with uh, government and institution and our friends from uh, the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority for the signing in Jijiga earlier this year of uh, a memorandum of understanding of cooperation involving regional governments from both Oromia and Somali regional governments and local communities and many stakeholders. This is aimed at finding solutions together which empower local communities and create livelihoods for the many thousands of people living in and around the sanctuary. We believe this is essential. We know that these are challenging times. It's not easy to implement the promises. But Babili has never enjoyed a viable wildlife economy. Tourism has never brought jobs or income to this area. Now, during the COVID pandemic and the conflict, the challenges are even greater. Our government is struggling to allocate funding for protected areas, and it's now more difficult than ever to make our case. We therefore welcome the EPI Foundation's involvement with Babili. We wish to work with it and the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority to find urgently needed short-term solutions that will protect wildlife and people and reduce the conflict between them. But we, are also, uh, we also need to tackle the complicated long-term realities that have always undermined Babile. So I call upon all of you to engage in this one of the treasures of our continent. 
Finally, let me say what a pleasure it is to see so many distinguished figures from academia, research centers, practitioners, and also from the leaders, top leaders, uh, leadership of uh, African countries. And of course, experts from across Africa at this event today. Uh, the problem uh, and the potential solutions in Barbella are specific and local. But at the same time, there is much we can learn from each other as we grapple with conservation and human elephant conflict challenges in different environments. Winnie, thank you so much. I know you are trying to check me. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, well, in the film, you also, my colleague Greta, who is leading the EPI Foundation's HEC team, not just in Ethiopia, but across the continent. And I want to welcome Greta now to speak to you. Thank you, Greta. Thank you, Winnie. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, colleagues, friends, distinguished guests. I would first like to acknowledge my profound gratitude to the courageous men and women featured in our short film, many of whom I've had the privilege of working with for years, but also the countless individuals in Babile and beyond who aren't featured in today's story, but who day in and day out are faced with the same terrifying realities of human elephant conflict and broader wildlife conflict. I cannot hope in a mere five minutes to address all the challenges of conservation and human wildlife conflict before us. But as we saw, the Babili Elephant Sanctuary and the people who live in and around it are facing devastating threats. Sadly, the, there are hundreds, if not thousands of landscapes across the global south in similar predicaments. How do we address human elephant conflict in an age of extreme inequality, poverty, ethnic conflict, climate breakdown, a global pandemic and histories of dispossession, displacement and divisions? The truth is it's incredibly complicated, but I fundamentally believe that we can start by acknowledging that the safeguarding of our ecosystem is not compatible with the boundless economic growth and the systems we currently all operate under. Loss of biodiversity threatens the land, air, water, and relatives with whom we share this planet. Of the roughly 4 billion species that have evolved over the last three and a half billion years, 99% of them have already gone extinct. In Ethiopia, in my lifetime alone, we have tragically lost over 80% of elephants yet human elephant conflicts are exponentially increasing. In a country that currently hosts fewer than 2,000 elephants and a human population projected to reach more than 205 million people in 30 years alone, finding a way to balance the needs of our people and the needs of our wildlife is a fundamental vital aspect of our coexistence. African elephants, perhaps more than any other species, confront us with this dilemma. As land's largest mammal, they need vast and intact ecosystems and in an increasingly human dominated planet. Unavoidably, therefore, elephant conservation is an intensely political issue. What is more sensitive after all than land? People and biodiversity need it. And yet so many of our protected areas across Africa were set aside under conservation models based on many racial, gender and class divisions. And to this day, many do not take into consideration or recognize the gravity of these truths in cultivating the root causes of biodiversity loss. These very inequalities, I believe, only compound the problem of human elephant conflict by undermining community rights and the ability for people and wildlife to effectively survive off of the land around them. It is crucial to note that we're not just talking about the sheer number of people who need access to resources, but the youthful age structure of Africa's populations. The overwhelming majority of those living on the outskirts of protected areas are children, adolescents, and young adults, many of whom do not have access to education, food security, and financial stability. We also know that threats and pressures, as well as large-scale industrial expansion on the environment, significantly intensifies gender inequalities, fuels the illegal wildlife trade, corruption, and upholds power imbalances across and within the communities themselves. It is time that the conservation community acknowledges that root causes of environmental degradation largely do not begin at the sites that we are trying to protect. They are often driven by people who hold power and privilege in faraway places, and who quite frankly are not threatened by the crop destruction, scarcity of resources, livestock predation, damage to property, or loss of life in their day-to-day. -day. The voices you have heard today from the front lines are those of people who have no power. We need policies which protect them, 
and enable them to co-create ways of coexisting and conserving the biodiversity they share space with sustainably and justly. I have long believed that technical prevention strategies are vital to buying us time. And the A Future for All report by UNEP and WWF released earlier this year is a prime example of phenomenal technology and mitigation strategies being implemented around the world by brilliant indigenous communities, scientists, ecologists, and conservationists. But the truth is they will only get us so far. Human elephant conflict, like all conflict, is dynamic and will ebb and flow for as long as our existence is tied and in, tied to competing with the same resources as wildlife. As John mentioned earlier today at the beginning of the event, these are the difficult conversations that we at the Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation want to continue to facilitate. I and my colleagues developed a strategy, which is by no means an end goal, but a living process and an invitation for everyone here to collaborate on finding solutions at high level and site level simultaneously. One of the pillars of our strategy, the Amplifying African Voices pillar is very close to my heart. It is time that Africa's people tell their own stories because stories move us, stories change history, stories give us hope, and more importantly, stories fuel our courage to keep going and demand change. It shouldn't be a radical idea to put African voices first and foremost in Africa's wildlife crisis. But today, I'm proud that we are one of many leading to a real shift in this narrative. We need flexible and inclusive dialogue between all stakeholders. We need to advocate for spatial planning that is rooted in human wildlife coexistence and universal justice. And we may not all agree on a way forward, but whether we like it or not, we are going to have to sit at this table together to facilitate context specific solutions, prioritize our collective well being, equal access to life sustaining resources, and our ability to share this planet with other species and each other. As long as we are here, we have not lost this fight. We will continue to learn from our mistakes and we will remain committed to building back better together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greta. Uh, it gives me much pleasure to note all those of you that have joined this call. I know my minister is on the call, Minister Balala. I know that um, His Excellency Ian Kama is here with us. Uh, minister from Cameroon, you're most welcome. I know that we have a bright one from uh, Malawi and a whole lot of others, including my good friend, Virginia McKenna. Thank you very much for joining us. We are now moving on swiftly and I want to bring the debate close to home. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the first lady of Kenya, Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, who sits on the EPI Leadership Council. And she speaks, um, to us about human elephant conflict in Kenya. She speaks to us from the elephant orphanage, so you will have a chance to see some elephants as you watch the recording. You're most welcome. Thank you. Your Excellency, the former president of Botswana, Your Excellency, the former prime minister of Ethiopia, members of the EPI Leadership Council and Foundation, distinguished participants. I wish to thank the EPI for covering this important event that brings leaders together, experts and advocates who share a common concern, elephant conservation. I applaud your success in bringing the human elephant conflict conversation to the fore. I would like to share Kenya's experience in elephant conservation, as well as our intervention efforts to address the current global concern of human elephant conflict. I will also share some thoughts of how we, as a conservation community, can step up our efforts through committed advocacy and collaboration with local communities. We know that Kenya has not been alone in its efforts of elephant conservation. Protecting our astounding species has been decades of global concern. It has brought together conservation advocates, leaders and experts from the African continent. In Kenya, our elephant population has more than doubled in the last 30 years. From 16,000 in 1989 to 34,354 in 2020. 
This is an extraordinary African conservation success story and testimony to prove that commitment from dedicated stakeholders can save our magnificent animals. Kenya's success story in its elephant conservation efforts stem from our national res resolve to cherish our wildlife, which is a major tourism income earner for our country. Our success has been a result of combined efforts of the government, both national and county. It has been through communities who live alongside the elephants. They have been consistent in their commitment to turn their challenges into solutions. The steady decline of poaching has been as, re as a result of strong political will, leadership, advocacy, and imposition of trophy bans. It has also been a result of brokering solution with diverse stakeholders who have shared similar conviction. We have stood together for a cause we believe. However, our success brings with it challenges because of the growth of both human and elephant populations. This is an issue that is very real to us. While elephants are treasured, they can be a very terrifying threat to individuals, families and communities. People are being killed, livelihoods are being destroyed, children are skipping school due to fear and elephants are being killed in retaliation. This human elephant conflict is threatening the hard won gains we have made in advocating human wildlife coexistence. The conversation today on human elephant conflict draws our attention to what we can do to turn this trajectory into an opportunity. I thank the EPI Foundation for enabling us to share our experiences, learn from each other and exchange ideas and best practices, latest technologies and techniques. This dialogue led by Africans is timely because it also provides us with an opportunity to present ambitious ideas, speak with one united voice and resolve, and hold each other accountable. Kenya has unique examples of conservation efforts that have worked, especially with lobby groups and local communities, who are the first line of defense for these treasured animals. Our interventions have required strengthening and building highly capable and functional institutions, putting in, in place robust policies and commensurate resource allocation. The Kenya Wildlife Service has conducted a successful deployment of Earth Ranger technology. These technologies have provided real-time online monitoring that have assisted in the deployment of timely interventions of human elephant conflict. Natural deterrents such as beehive fencing in the Savo National Park have also recorded award-winning success in helping to protect farmers from elephant invasion. Women are said to play an important role in conservation. I have witnessed how incorporating women's empowerment into conservation has worked. Through the amazing work of the Imbirikani Women Beading Project and the Beadworks Kenya Initiative. These are some examples of livelihood projects focusing on conservation that are working well. Through the Hands Off Our Elephants Initiative, I have witnessed the power and impact of advocacy. But all these noble efforts need support and strong collaboration if we want to solve our current challenge. More resources and practical solutions need to be adopted in our conservation efforts so that we can build a better future where humans and wildlife coexist peacefully. I commit to add my voice to advocate for more action in addressing the human elephant conflict. I thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I know how much you enjoyed your day out with the elephants at the Elephant Orphanage. We want to thank Sheldrick Wildlife Trust for the work that they do and the privilege of letting us spend time with the elephants as we did that recording. I want to recognize now the presence of Minister from Malawi, Dr. Michael Z, you're welcome. I want to recognize Ambassador Kamere. I know that we have many distinguished guests in our webinar and I just want to thank you for making time to join us. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the EPI Leadership Council. His Excellency, the former president of Botswana, Ian Kama, has played a major role, very vital role in the founding of the EPI back in 2014. Your Excellency, we are honored that you can be with us today, speaking with, to us live from Gaberone. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Winnie. Um, it's always very nice to see you again. Um, I'd like to acknowledge His Excellency, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and Her Excellency, the First Lady of Kenya, uh, honorable ministers, other distinguished participants. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak at this event today and to join such a knowledgeable array of speakers. I appreciate I appreciate being given the opportunity to speak on a very important issue that is of great concern for the survival of elephants and the protection of people and their property. In 2014, as president, I took Botswana into the EPI as one of the five founding member countries. I was determined to conserve our country's elephants and people's livelihoods, and also to boost cooperation amongst fellow African leaders who shared in this important objective. Today, as chair of the EPI's Leadership Council, I remain just as committed to this course. I also acknowledge that the nature of the threats to elephants has changed during these past seven years. In 2014, poaching for ivory was our number one concern. It still is, of course, a major issue in many parts of Africa, and one which requires a concerted international effort in order to suppress. In recent years, we have seen human elephant conflict creeping up the agenda to the point where many now feel it is the greatest threat to the survival of the African elephant. Make no mistake, human elephant conflict is indeed a Pan-African challenge. It is a big problem, even in my own country, which has one of the largest elephant populations on the planet. But it's also a challenge for countries with smaller elephant populations but of course, which are no less determined to preserve them. As we have just seen from the example of Bibile in, in Ethiopia, we are witnessing human elephant conflict in every one of the 21 African countries that now belong to the EPI. People and elephants are increasingly competing for land and natural resources. With a few notable exceptions, in specific places, this is not happening because we have more elephants, but rather because we have more people. And these people need jobs, food, and opportunities. Africa's leaders are beholden to strive to create these. So the question then arises, how do they do so whilst conserving elephants? Governments are desperate for so such solutions as they face severe backlash from their citizens who put them under a lot of pressure to deal with conflict, which drives them to take decisions that don't always resolve the issue and can end up being detrimental to wildlife in general. This conflict is exacerbated, I believe, by the ever more tangible threat of climate change. I see this in my own country, where drought is pushing people and elephants into ever greater competition. People need water and so do elephants and our options are narrowing. We both want the same things. I'm therefore grateful that the EPI Foundation, our secretariat is now grappling with the critical issue of human elephant conflict. 
I applaud it for organizing this event and bringing such a diversity of our voices and perspectives together. It is a unique opportunity for us to raise the profile of these issues, learn from each other, to find out about best practices in other countries, and study differences and similarities in the challenges we face across the continent. I'm also encouraged that the EPI Foundation is putting our African voices and perspectives at the forefront of its work on human elephant conflict. This is the only way to ensure success. We need our friends and supporters in other parts of the world to hear these perspectives, to understand the magnitude of the challenges we face and to support our efforts. At the same time, we ask governments here in Africa to take wildlife into consideration as they plan for economic and social infrastructure. In our planning, we cannot ignore historic elephant migration routes. To do so is a recipe for further conflict. We must look ahead, plan ahead, and avoid potential conflict where we can. The HEC, the letters HEC on human elephant conflict can also be referred to as human elephant coexistence. That is exactly what our aim should be, to transit from conflict to coexistence. Our task and challenge is to promote those methods and projects that are already in successful use in some range states, to share such methods with each other and to develop even more. The stakes are very high. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about elephant conservation is because I know that if we save our elephants, we will also be saving so much of our precious biodiversity, so many other wonderful animals and plants. And in doing so, we will be helping to mitigate the impact of climate change, which will benefit everyone. But in the same mold, we will be just as importantly protecting people and their livelihoods. This is where the EPI comes in, to offer such solutions through tried and tested methods already in practice and others yet to be developed. I'm confident that these objectives will be achieved after what I've heard from excellent presentations today. Friends, your excellencies, colleagues, if we find solutions that achieve the harmonious coexistence of people and elephants, then we will be ensuring that Africa and indeed our entire planet is a healthier, happier, and more prosperous place. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you for the leadership you continue to offer in this area. And now we move on. We go to Chad. We are going to listen to Honorable Mahamat Ahmad Lazina the Minister for Environment, who is going to be speaking out to us on a live recording. I want to note the presence of many distinguished participants. We have ambassadors, Ambassador Kiran Sutha, we have Ambassador Suleiman, we have many distinguished conservationists on this chat, and I just want to say, Karibu, welcome to this um, very uh, wide-ranging and broad webinar that brings so many people together to speak about an important issue. Let's now listen to his uh, Honorable Mahamat. Thank you. Dear friends, invited guests, dear participants, from the outset, I would like to sincerely thank the EPI Foundation and all of you for giving us this precious opportunity, which allows us to speak about the conservation of elephants in Chad and the human elephant conflict. I am aware that we do not speak very often on this issue in the international debate concerning the future of uh, the elephant in Africa. It is sad to note that since independence in 1960, Chad has lost thousands of elephants because of 
uh, ivory, but it's also true that despite that, uh, we still have uh, a viable population of elephants, about 1,500 uh, elephants. Half of these elephants are found in the National Park of Zakuma, where the population is still growing. Indeed, Zakuma is a beacon of hope because uh, with the support of our partners and local communities, we have demonstrated what can be done and how we can inverse the poaching tendency and restore the wild fauna and, their, and its habitats. The Lieutenant General, the Head of State, President of the Republic, uh, President of the Republic, Mamad Idrisdivi, and the transition government, uh, who's uh, led by Kapadi Arber, are determined to see that the success that we've known in Zakuma can be replicated elsewhere. Chad joined EPI as a founding member in 2014 and is still today committed committed today to conserve the African elephant. We have suffered from instability, which we've seen in uh, some of our neighboring countries, but still, we still had success, significant success in the uh, uh, conservation of, of, of uh, the wildlife. Now, to come back to the issue that is uh, of interest of us today, the conflict between humans and elephants, is for us in Chad a real and very serious problem, even if some elephant populations in the Lake Chad, Lake Fitri, and uh, the Chari River Valley are small, there are serious conflicts in all these places between farmers and elephants. Our human population is increasing and uh, people are suffering from hunger and how can you convince them to protect elephants? We cannot preach to them on the advantages of biodiversity. We need to find practical solutions. In the past, we tried to offer money to compensate to the people who had uh, been victims of uh, damage caused by elephants. But today, we quickly realized that this solution was not sustainable. Indeed, the available funds were not enough to finance all these claims, and it was very difficult to show that all the claims as well were relevant. We do have a number of experiences in the management of the conflict between humans and elephants in areas like uh, the uh, Chad Lake, uh, Fitri Lake, and uh, around the Zekuma National Park. These experiences pushed us to strengthen local capacities to push away elephants through training and by providing specific equipment like uh, uh, systems of alert by using satellite technology and radio. These uh, experiences have given us reliable results and need to be supported. Despite uh, the coronavirus pandemic, my country had uh, was earning little money and uh, few jobs were created because of tourism. Today, 18 months since the start of this pandemic, the situation is more uh, critical than before. We therefore need support, technical expertise, as well as financial in order to resolve this conflict between humans and elephants. We would like there to pay tribute to, to this initiative of the EPI Foundation, which allows us to speak with other authorities and the public opinion. We would like to exchange ideas with our brothers and sisters in Africa to find efficient measures in order to mitigate uh, the ele elephant-human conflict 
what kind of barriers is the most efficient, but also how we can uh, compensate people who have been damaged by this conflict. And we believe that EPI is a forum it's a precious forum to help Africans to share their experiences and also find a solution, a rapid solution, especially for our elephant population who are leaving the Sharibagirmi area and go through the uh, Buso area and create such havoc that every day in our country we receive complaints by uh, the people living there around about uh, the damage caused by elephants yesterday when i was before the national assembly i raised this issue and uh, this issue is still uh, topical and uh, we believe uh, that uh, with a strong cooperation and a responsible cooperation a citizen cooperation with our partner the uh, epi foundation we shall find a, a solution to these uh, problems we are also happy to see that the epi foundation is promoting this issue of uh, conflict between humans and uh, wild fauna and wildlife in general with our partners and our friends at the international level we need the same commitment of uh, donors in order to uh, resolve this conflict as they did in the past when we were fighting against poaching for ivory. We also acknowledge our own responsibility as a government. When we plan development projects and economic infrastructure, we need to think of elephants and other wild animals and take into account, take into account their uh, space, historic space, and their migration routes. If we don't do that, they will have other conflicts in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having listened to me. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Um, we are now continuing on our journey, heading south to Angola. Secretary of State for the Environment in Angola, Paula Kelo, has been a steadfast supporter and a friend of the EPI for many years. I know she wanted to be with us this afternoon, but for unavoidable reasons, she couldn't join us, but we have a recording from her. So we're going to listen to that straight away. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocols observed. I'd like, first of all, to speak about the team we are talking today, thanking in the name of the Angolan government for the opportunity for us to expose our contributes on the, our elef African elephant uh, matters. Thus, allow me to say that Angola, just as many other countries that spoke, uh, possesses a, a unique history that is spoken by many. And now with greater emphasis by the community, it is the human elephant um, uh, um, uh, conflict. The history of elephants in Angola takes us to a very negative um, uh, aspect re related to the civil war and, uh, and the poaching and many deaths uh, it has reduced um, uh, uh, the number of elephant populations. The recent Angolan history, it is seen with uh, re recognized environmental um, um, issues. Uh, we have actually um, uh, normally Italy, we have a meeting, a national meeting that we deal with uh, uh, with awareness of the uh, of the the situation. Even though Angola has experienced uh, a reduction in population in elephant population, uh, by the causes already highlighted, we have to say that in 2016, the annual um, uh, report of uh, of environmental conservancy. It has estimated that Angola adds a population animal uh, uh, elephant population of 3,000 to 6,000 is a very concern. Uh, so programs were drafted to address the state of elephants in Angola. Uh, as well, we have 
uh, under, undergo, we are training personnel in order to be able to deal with issues related to the poaching and uh, the co the living between animal uh, 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 elephants and uh, uh, and uh, human and elephant um, are living. That is why we still continue to dialogue with many other institutions so that the natural um, uh, 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 um, uh, habitat of uh, elephants is, 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 is actually in peace. The mines, we have a lot of uh, mining, the mining processes so that we can uh, actually create a great um, environment for the for the elephant population. Our government is seeking various solutions for everyone and for future generations. Your Excellencies, a new scenery is the uh, population growth in rural zones that promotes the uh, territory occupational uh, territory. So this is also the increasing occupancy. Uh, it is a conflict as well aspect between elephants and uh, uh, humans. So you, food security is also a very um, a pertinent concern because the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cohabitation between human and elephants is not always easy to deal with it. So the populations are questioning the government, what can we do to reduce these problems? So our technicians, uh, are drafting um, uh, some posters and diagnoses that are the first steps to mitigate this problem through many projects. We have to highlight as well the, the sixth um, project of the Global Fund uh, that resolves these problems. Your Excellencies, the Angolan government is dealing with the concern, the, is dealing with these issues, and we believe that with the steps that we have given until now, it is possible to reduce the crime re related to the species. We have the the permanent support of the uh, uh, law firms and uh, institutions. Thus, we have taken significant steps to embrace partnerships with many uh, a private sector and the civil society for a greater management, promoting um, employment and financing through eco-tourism and reducing the human elephant conflictions. Or we are looking for natural um, ways to deal with these uh, 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 situations. Excellencies, I don't want to finish my speech to say that uh, without saying that the pandemic is also hindering our, uh, our um, co collaborations. But even though we affirm uh, so that we, are, we can learn from you and sharing experiences, we embrace these uh, um, initiatives initiative recognizing the importance of these questions related to animals and uh, human life. And we encourage everybody to join the cause. To finish, I want to um, appeal everyone so that we can work together to work on environmental issues uh, and uh, because the biodiversity issues are very severe. We have to work together so that we cannot, so that the, the, the species can be preserved. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Paula. Distinguished participants, I see many uh, conservation colleagues, friends on this call, Dr. Patrick Omondi, Ali Kaka, my good friend, Minister Rosalie Matondo from Congo and colleagues, Jan Bosco also from Congo. I want to just appreciate you for joining this webinar. I know that Professor Segor from Kenya is also here. I think I saw Ian Redbond somewhere on the participants list, my good friend and, and who works very hard all across Africa advocating for elephants. And so we are moving on swiftly. Uh, and now we look forward, as we look forward to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, you know, the COP is going to be in China next month. We have a very special message from my fellow East African, Elizabeth Murema, Executive Secretary of UN's uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. We want to hear from her 
how the post 2020 strategic framework on biodiversity will address human elephant conflict. Let's now listen to a recording from Elizabeth Murema. Ministers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please let me offer my sincere thanks to the hosts for inviting the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity to deliver a statement at this event. Important meetings such as this provide yet another positive signal that wildlife protection must be a critical element of the global biodiversity agenda in the emerging post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Just a few weeks ago, governments from around the world, along with a broad range of key stakeholders, came together virtually to advance their work towards a new framework that can guide the global effort to reverse nature loss in the next decade and serve as a catalyst to accelerate the transformations needed to safeguard the health of people and planet alike. They considered a formal first draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework and further refined the goals, targets, and elements needed to ensure it will be both ambitious and transformative. Their work also helped maintain political momentum towards the adoption of the framework at the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties in coming next year. Distinguished participants, a new global agreement, one that aims to allow humanity to live in harmony with nature, could not come at the more critical time. The intertwined nature of complex problems, such as climate change and the loss of global biodiversity, has never been clearer. Every flood, every wildfire, every species gone extinct exposes our own dependencies and vulnerability. The first draft of the emerging global framework addresses human wildlife conflict, both directly and through related issues such as consumption and trade, education, traditional knowledge, and the benefits from biodiversity related to nutrition, food security, livelihood, health, and well-being. I was pleased to see the excellent contribution of the Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation to the framework. I commend you for reminding delegates to account for the world's growing rates of population, consumption, infrastructure, and competition for land and resources, as these will increase the likelihood of human wildlife conflict. As you noted, they should also ensure the framework reflects the need for measures to solve, mitigate, and prevent human-wildlife conflict, including through sound land use and strategic planning. You also contributed many valuable ideas to the discussions during the third working group meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, the message is very clear. We must reconsider our relationship with nature, in particular, our relationship with wildlife, as our actions must benefit not only humans, but also the species of our planet. We must recall that reducing human wildlife conflict and improving the coexistence with nature is important not only for human health and well-being, but also for reducing threats to wildlife. Human wildlife conflict may also be managed by empowering indigenous peoples and local communities. Approaches that involve the full participation of local communities can lead to better coexistence between human and wildlife, as well as to opportunities and benefits, not just for impacted communities, but for society as a whole, sustainable development, production, and the global economy at large. In closing, as the journey to Kunming continues in the coming year, the world will have an opportunity to achieve an unprecedented level of political ambition to reduce and reverse biodiversity loss, safeguard the invaluable contribution of biodiversity worldwide, and ensure that the benefits are shared fairly and equitably. Efforts to reduce human-wildlife conflict 
must be a critical part of this effort. The wise elephants seem to understand this essential point. As the EPI Foundation has noted, the recent migration of a herd of 15 wild elephants in China brought them close to the venue of the Conference of the Parties 15 in Kuoming. I commend the EPI Foundation for working closely with their counterparts in China and for their efforts to ensure that the reduction of human wildlife conflict will be part of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Your work will have profound impacts for the next century and beyond. Although the framework is still work in progress, I'm encouraged by your unwavering determination to build a future that respects nature's values and core benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have heard from Elizabeth Murema. What a wonderful way to end those presentations. I indeed, um, she is a distinguished speaker and has touched all the points that we are trying to look at as we go into the future. And now distinguished participants, we want to go into the question and answer session. We are doing very well on time. Um, our distinguished panelists are still with us. So, and I know that you have been putting your questions up in the Q&A box. So we're going to go straight into it and start with some questions. Um, now, there are a lot of questions for Babile. So um, Greta, your excellency, uh, there'll be a lot, a lot of questions and you will um, share probably the, the, the challenge here. Now, the first question I'm gonna ask, what are the long-term solutions that combine conservation science and indigenous knowledge systems to bring about human elephant conflict, human elephant coexistence in Babile? How does the EPI and its partners work with communities living in and around Babile? That question, it's about Babile. Uh, Your Excellency, do you want to go first? Yes, uh, Winnie, thank you very much for uh, moderating. I think uh, this is a very complex uh, problem. You know, the area with the population grows, and uh, we have uh, different communities uh, and ethnic groups uh, that in the boundary of uh, Babile uh, Sanctuary. It's a very huge area, but uh, encroached by people because of uh, you know, the harsh environment that uh, necessitated people to go into uh, the sanctuary and uh, continue on their uh, livelihood works there. So all the solutions that we have, we, we should, uh, come in in Babile should be very comprehensive. And uh, in the first place, we have to divide it into short term and long term. Uh, at least we have to stop uh, the killings now. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a need for uh, political commitment. And what we have done so far is uh, we were able with uh, the federal government and the regional, the two regional governments, which are the boundaries of uh, Babile, to have a stakeholders a meet, comprehensive meeting to understand the problem itself. And uh, we made uh, everybody, including my own foundation, to sign a memorandum of understanding how to go about to solve this problem. So that is, you know, if you understand the problem, it all means that we have gone 50% of the solution. Uh, and we also included uh, the local community and the uh, elders and leaders of the local community. They are all very much worried uh, when the elephant and also the human conflict is creating problems for both elephants as well as humans. Uh, but they love the elephants. They want to coexist with them. So the problem is how can we help the local community to have their livelihood addressed? and the need for development in that area should be addressed. So we need a comprehensive solution, not just administrative solution, but uh, which you know, makes people to be resenting and ultimately the, the conflict will continue on. So I think uh, now there is a, a local mechanism where elders are discussing on issues, how to resolve it. And 
we have to, you know, we have to have a clear project. Uh, both the federal and regional governments are ready to support uh, this project. Of course, the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority has studied it and has brought some technical solutions, which should have social and environmental issues included in it. And I think with this, we are, we are, you know, it's a very complex, but we are in a position to to resolve that uh, problem in, in, in a near future. Uh, but it should be a long-term engagement. It cannot be a, you know, a quick fix uh, solution. And uh, the most important thing is uh, we need support. We need support from everyone who is listening uh, to this uh, discussion from every corner. Of course, EPI through the East African office is working with us and as a partnering with us, but that's not enough. I think we need more support from uh, every corner uh, of the globe to save this uh, habitat, as well as humans, uh, the population there. Some people are talking about the population pressure and, you know, why don't we control population? I don't agree that with the word control population. I mean, we should have a population policy, but the, so the so-called control is not, is not a good word. We have to manage it. We have to have a good policy uh, to have it. In Africa, I don't think that there is a problem of land and the population pressure. It is a problem of clear policy of development where it can engage more people in one place. And uh, the problem of urbanization, we have to you know, somehow expedite the urbanization so that people gather together, leaving the, you know, the punch of land, which is habitat for the wildlife. So I think we have to have a fast accelerated economic growth in Africa. With the current pace of growth, I think we can't handle the population we have at the moment. So I think we need to have a comprehensive solution. Of course, a, a comprehensive population policy, which focuses on girls' education first, so that they understand that, you know, uh, having a balanced uh, family is an important thing for them and for the whole entire community. So uh, we have a comprehensive approach and we continue with that. It's a very difficult thing, but we have to face the bull, you know, catch the bull by the horn. There is no way we can, we can go away. Thank you, Your Excellency. Indeed, a comprehensive answer. And you bring that high level political engagement that is required in such complex situations. Um, there's a question here, which I believe is best directed to His Excellency Ian Kama. This is the relationship between human elephant conflict or human elephant coexistence, as you call it, and climate change. And how can we access climate finance to help address human elephant coexistence? I just wanted to touch on what was being said earlier on about the, uh, the conflict issue as um, uh, alluded to by the former prime minister. And just to give the example of here, that our situation has been brought about by the fact that uh, we have seen um, over the years a tremendous buildup in the elephant populations in this country, brought about partly by managing the elephant population. But where we got into a bit of a uh, into a bit of turmoil with the human elephant conflict was that we saw a lot of elephant coming in from neighboring states where there was um, significant poaching. And elephants are able to detect where they are safe and where they are not safe. And Botswana um, was at one stage a very safe haven for elephants. And we found that by the time I left office, we were talking about numbers in the region of about 160 to 180,000 elephants. And when we had periods of good rains, the elephants would spread across the country and were starting to take up um, occupation in areas that they hadn't been in many, many years. Um, so for us, that became a challenge. But we had 
um, people in the country, one who I could mention, you may have heard of him before, a very, a man who has got tremendous expertise as a wildlife researcher, Dr. Michael Chase, who was able to come up with um, methods, technologies that were able to secure people's livelihoods. If I put it simply, you know, if you have a field of crops, be able to put up technologies which were able to secure. And these things worked. And that was something which I was hoping um, or intending to do is to hold a workshop for the EPI um, in, 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 in Kenya once this pandemic is over to bring people to get, together to be able to share their experiences and methods with one another so that it is not sort of like we are not operating in silos when we talk about what is actually a continental problem. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Indeed, you bring some very important points there and you're certainly welcome to Kenya. As you can see, our first lady is very committed to this course and we will be certain to hold all of you together as we deliberate on how to deal with this challenge. Now, uh, Greta, maybe you want to just speak about the EPI strategy and what it is we are doing to develop better relations between people and wildlife so that we can uh, address this issue of human elephant conflict. Um, this question has come up several times, so maybe you can speak about the strategy and how it looks at the engagement of people in uh, dealing with human elephant conflict. Thank you so much, Winnie and your excellencies for your fantastic responses. Um, indeed, the strategy, as you will see, as it's available to download for anybody on the call, it really is trying to tackle this colossal issue in a practical way. Uh, because there are many, many working on the ground, whether they're NGOs or communities themselves, in trying to find quick fi fixes and solutions that are needed in the interim, in the short term, because that after all, elephant and human conflict, it, it can be fatal, and therefore they don't have time. They don't have time for us to be negotiating policies and so on. Um, this needs to happen simultaneously. So the strategy really encompasses all of the levels that we at the EPI believe need to be tackled simultaneously with our leaders, with NGOs, with civil society at large. The three pillars are fostering high level dialogue. And essentially this is doing exactly what we're doing today, bringing together our African leaders, extensive connections, the organizations that we believe we can work with and the international media to try and discuss and have difficult conversations about what the priorities are. How can we create practical solutions and funding mechanisms to bring about change on the ground? This is not easy, but this is just the start. Second, we want to look at enabling local solutions because at the, at the very highest level, we need to change policy, but in the interim, we need to be able to help communities in the now so that elephants aren't being killed and so that communities aren't suffering. The way that we plan to do this and hopefully with all of the partners on this call to fundraise ways to assess, evaluate and implement context specific solutions. This means trying to tackle and prevent and mitigate the most pressing issues in the, for example, in Babile. And then the last one is really amplifying the African voices. Because as we know, and His Excellency in Kama knows and Haile Mariam and Dessalina as well, that we have different views, different opinions about how to do this. And because it is so different in every country, because our policies are so different, Ethiopia has a very large population. Other nations that have much smaller population are still facing human elephant conflict. So how we do this means that we need to respect and encourage the different voices, not just one fits all because it will just not work everywhere. So looking at these three pillars and then going into more detailed partnerships with people on the ground, that is how the EPI hopes to tackle this issue and really create a platform for all of the stakeholders to find solutions and, and really try and protect people and elephants. Thank you very much, Greta. And I have a number of questions on the use of technology, and especially for monitoring and data collection. There's clearly a, a realization from the participants of the data gaps and scarcity that makes it impossible to guide 
policy and practice around um, resolving human elephant conflict. I don't know if any of you wants to address yourselves to the issue of technology, the use of data. How do we progress the way that we understand human elephant conflict using different technologies instead of the traditional ways in which we have gathered the information? I don't know if any of you wants to address yourself to that issue. Are you referring to technologies as they referred to um, limiting, managing the conflict between people and elephants? Yes, I, the questions are about, say, the use of geographical information systems, the use of technologies like Earth Ranger, uh, the use of technologies and the ability to deploy them in communities, because I think the thinking is some of these technologies are very much applied at a very high level. How can we use technology to better understand and monitor human elephant conflict and therefore develop ways of mitigation? Well, technologies are definitely the key. There's no doubt about that, that if we want to make progress in this regard, in managing this conflict, and like I said earlier in my, when I was making my remarks about moving to coexistence, it is exactly these technologies that have to be developed in order to achieve that. And when I made reference to the fact of holding a workshop, it is that I know out there already, there do exist a number of technologies which are already in operation. And I referred to uh, one such individual here in our country, Dr. Michael Chase, who has developed technologies which are working extremely successfully in helping to manage that, uh, that, that conflict. And I think, as I said, I would really urge that we need to get people together who have developed such technologies to share their experiences so that others, when they go back after such workshops, are able, are able to implement um, uh, both technologies to uh, counter the effects of conflict and also to monitor populations, elephant populations, as they move around, especially you know, you went, you, you'll find my experience here is that from year to year, you have different migrations taking place. There may be some which are standard, which are pretty much um, common every year, but depending on climate change, rainfall patterns and what have you, it tends to also influence the movement of elephants and therefore technologies to be able to monitor that and to be able to have early warning of where there's likely to be conflict is very important. Thank you very much. I don't know if any, anybody else, Greta, do you want to speak to that issue of technology? Absolutely. His Excellency covered it very well. I completely agree that, in, especially in countries like Ethiopia, where we lack the capacity to manage our natural resources, to manage our elephant populations, technology would be a vital resource for our local communities and the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority to provide support to the communities. If we know where the elephants are heading, especially now, with regards to climate change, a lot of our wildlife is not congregating where it's expected. It's not staying within boundaries of protected areas. After all, protected areas are human created spaces. Wildlife does not listen or, or know of these borders. And in Babile, we have elephants moving up to five kilometers out of the official boundary or where they're supposed to congregate. If we knew this in advance, we'd be able to create systems of early warning for the communities in order to re reduce as much as possible and mitigate any interface between them, especially in the difficult evening moments, in the night, in the early mornings. And then you would prevent fatality. And also you would be increasing tolerance within those communities. Because over time, if communities are being challenged time and time again by elephants, it is almost inevitable for them to have retaliatory killing. So technology is definitely vital for us to start understanding how we can manage the technical human elephant conflict management. I also think that developing transparent ways as well as indigenous ways of understanding the land and cooperating with local communities right from the beginning will, will increase our success rates, making this information available to other areas as well. So getting all of the different stakeholders to communicate, to cooperate, and also finance. To, to be honest, these things are very expensive. 
communities and our country cannot afford a lot of the technology. So making this readily affordable for local communities, for countries across the African continent that would like to implement this is key going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, time goes so fast when a discussion is so good. I want to uh, thank all of you who have stayed with us. Uh, as a dean, uh, joining us all the way from the US, as a dean down is the, the CEO of IFO. Thank you very much. We, we, we are happy that you have so many experiences across Africa in Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and you are going to certainly be on our next panel as we talk about these issues. And now uh, there's the questions about infrastructure. We know that in Africa, we, our governments are constantly looking at development of roads, railways, new power lines and, and pipeline, uh, oil pipelines. How can we better address this development of infrastructure in such a way that it doesn't impact the migratory parts of elephants and push them towards human settlements? Because this seems to be a big problem all across all across Africa. I, I don't know whether Excellency Desalen, you want to just speak to this issue of if infrastructure. Uh, Winnie, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, even though it's late, uh, let me greet my uh, brother, former president uh, of Botswana, Ian Kama, Your Excellency, yeah. and uh, also Your Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, uh, and all the ministers here. I think this is a, a, an issue for us leaders um, uh, very much because, you know, this kind of infrastructure development needs a, a very rigorous planning. And that planning shouldn't be left to only technical personnel. It should be discussed with the people. It should be discussed with uh, and, and proper environmental impact assessment should be done. Uh, if not, then the destruction is so huge, including our urban planning has to be done in a very meticulous manner. And if we do have a proper planning, then I think the implementation, if, if not uh, uh, completely uh, avoid it, but can address most of the problems and our coexistence becomes much more suitable. Let me tell you one example. We had uh, a sugar uh, plantation uh, which is constructed alongside one of the largest uh, national parks in Ethiopia. And people are very much eager to take the fertile land in the national park to the sugar plantation. They said, you know, the, the motto was, is it the wildlife or the humans that we should give priority? I think either or is not a solution. I mean, uh, some conservationists do not want development at all. And some politicians do not want any wildlife conservation. So both of them are wrong. I think we should balance and bring you know, coexistence and togetherness in the planning process so that everybody agrees that we need to develop. And at the same time, we need to conserve our environment and we, we need to keep our biodiversity safe. So I think uh, this is the way we can handle the infrastructure issue, but it's a very challenging issue if we just leave for ministries and technicians without involving all the stakeholders, including local communities and, and civil society organizations. I thank you. Thank you very much. We, we want to hear from Chad because uh, all these challenges that we speak about uh, are very much alive in 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 West and 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 uh, in West Africa, and and we know that our Chadian brothers are uh, can speak to us about what it is like to manage elephants in 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 the face of climate change, in the face of all these challenges, uh, uh, conflicts that uh, we are facing at the moment. Uh, perhaps you want to just comment about uh, uh, conservation of elephants and human elephant conflict in Chad and beyond. Yeah, thank you, uh, Winnie. Uh, I think in the absence of uh, my minister and on behalf of the, his head of uh, office, I can take the floor and uh, uh, interact with you in the technical aspect, technical point of view. 
uh, as the, as you have listened to the speech from the minister, uh, tech is a real problem here in Chad. Huh? Although we have a small elephant population, uh, human elephant conflict is a reality. Uh, you can know if a single elephant is around a village, it's almost be a problem for, for local uh, population. So uh, we uh, are dealing at the daily base for the people that are claiming for uh, having a negative impact of the elephant uh, presence around their, uh, their areas. And uh, for us, um, climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, together with COVID are the three biggest uh, problem of the mankind today. And they need to be, they are also linked and they need to be to, to, to have solutions. And uh, 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 we think the best way is to set up within a country an effective and representative network of protected area that can help us to use those areas specifically as a refuge for, 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 for wildlife, for elephant. Because elephant, you cannot mix elephant with population, even they are few in the area, as I, I am saying, even elephants are very small, they can create people if they mix with population. So our main challenge is how we can come up with a set of uh, protected areas, especially a national park, like we have one that is very effective, well-managed in Zakuma National Park. We want to create more protected area to effectively manage elephant. As, and, and also the problem with infrastructure development, the need for the for the road, for, for, for industry. As you, we, we can remember what um, the, the leader of uh, India said to us, Mahmoud Gandhi, he said, a nation, the greatness if a na of a nation cannot be well measured without the way he manages wildlife. You can, if you develop without taking care of your land, you cannot be considered yourself as a developed country. You cannot see the, consider yourself as, as a human population, a human society, that is its progress without protecting to your land. So whatever we use the policy of development, you have to take into account the, the need, especially the need of space for wildlife. That is, that's our, our, our conviction here in chat, unless at the technical level, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Domia Malaki. Domia is a colleague with the EPI. He's based in Chad. Now, I would love to continue this debate, but we've run out of time. It's been a precious, wonderful. I'm so glad that so many of you have stayed with us to the end. Of course, this debate has to continue and the EPI Foundation is determined as a Pan-African organization to continue with this kind of dialogue. Let me remind you that we have just launched our human elephant conflict strategy. Uh, uh, Greta has highlighted uh, the pillars of our strategy. And we want to look at the role of African leaders. We want to think about local solutions. We want to raise African voices that we in our strategy believe it makes a difference. The stories told by Africans, the solutions uh, of African problems that are found and progressed by Africans. So we are very, very determined to continue with this debate. And indeed with the leadership that we have and the strategy that we have, we believe that indeed we can only go forward strongly I want to thank the team behind the scenes, the EPI team, Barnaby Phillips and Victoria and everyone, the translators, everyone who's worked extremely hard to make this happen. I'm sure they've forgiven me for showing up in the dark at the beginning. <laughs> there was a kind of existential crisis there where Barnaby went, I can't see you. I hope now that you have seen me enough. Thank you very much. Um, and we want to thank Conservation International. Would never have been able to hold this uh, broad webinar with a translation without the generous support of Co Conservation International. We want to thank all our partners that have really joined us and stayed with us during this conversation. And we hope that the next event you will 
join in as many numbers as you have. That even as we get to the end of this, I want to just, I know that there are many of you who have asked questions, but that just shows how big and important this issue is and the need for us to continue this dialogue. So if your question was not answered, please bear with us. We do have to finish this on time, uh, but we promise you that we will continue with this dialogue. I want to thank the CEO of the, who has led us into this area of human elephant conflict. And we know that difference. On that note, a good morning, a good afternoon if you're in the UK, and a good evening if you're in Africa somewhere. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you staying with us. Thank you. Asante sana. Au revoir. <laughs>